What's up, everybody? Andrew Mahone here with Tricky Jim at Full Grip Games. Going to be presenting the Wednesday night league tournament for you all here today. Standard format. Back in standard format, we've got four rounds this evening. Should be a great time. Brady Botner on the right versus Andrew Barlow on the left. These players have been practicing expanded format for the last couple of weeks here gearing up for those regional championships. Big shout out to Jesse Parker for providing those sweet new Tag Team GX markers for us to show off on the screen there as well. So really excited about those. And this should be a great night of Pokemon for us all here at Full Grip Games this evening. Thank you all for showing up. What's up, Ewok Chief, Jack, ML Gaming-ish? Switch Gamer. What's up, guys? Thank you all for joining us this evening. Appreciate y'all. Brady's going to go ahead, draw his hand, mulliganed the first one, and we'll see if he can find anything the second time around here. He does find a basic, and Barlow will take a mulligan. This is round one of our league tournament. Now let's get it going here, see who we have in the active position for each player so that I can get an appropriate image up. Uh, I got the Gengar Mimikyu from our last tournament still there now, but it's all good. I think I saw that Brady is playing a Lightning deck, so potentially Pikachu and Zekrom or Zapdos should be a safe bet. I know that uh, Brady is a big Zapdos fan. He took the Zapdos deck to the Collinsville Regional Championships. Sure enough, Andrew Barlow looks to be playing Zorark. He's on the draw, so he'll take his top deck for turn. It looks like he's playing Zorark Lycanroc. Still a very, very strong deck in our standard format. Going to start things off with Ultra Ball. And looking to discard two cards there. We do see that he does have the double colorless in hand as well. So he is ready to attack on turn two potentially considering going for a Tapu Lele to get a big draw for this turn one here. Usually wanting to grab a Lily. A lot of the Zorark Lycanroc decks are favoring Lily as the turn one draw supporter for turn. And that is in stark contrast to expanded format where we see a lot of Zorark decks going for turn one Bridget. Uh, Elm has usually fallen out of favor in standard, though we do see Barlow going for that turn one Elm here, which is great. He's already got a Rock Ruff on his bench and his Rue in the active position, so he can fill out the remainder of his bench here. And if he has another draw card for next turn, he will get off to an explosive turn two as this game gets started. Going first is also a huge advantage for Zorark Lycanroc since Andrew will be able to evolve up uh, uh, first before Brady gets to evolve, even though I don't think Brady's deck will play many, if any, evolutions. Andrew gets to evolve quickly and then also target down threats on Brady's side of the field with a quick turn to Lycanroc. Bloodthirsty Eyes can target down lowly threats on Brady's bench. It also gives Brady a one turn window to use abilities before Andrew gets to evolve that Ditto Prism Star potentially into an Alolan Muck. That would be the play that I am looking out for on Andrew's side. Brady starts off with a Nest Ball and we're gonna see what kind of basic Pokemon he's running here. I'm assuming this is a Zapdos deck. I did see a Blitzel there as well and some fighting energies. So this is Brady's uh, fighting Ultra Beast variant of Zapdos. I think he plays Viridian Forest in order to help him get those fighting energies. And he's gonna be looking to use Buzzwool, the non-GX Buzzwool, to get a Sledgehammer turn in on Andrew's four prize turn. Buzzwool Sledgehammer will take a big one hit knockout if Andrew is not able to play around that four prize turn since Brady is playing an entirely non-GX deck, except for maybe a Tapu Koko GX, which is not in play, then he should be able to force Barlow into that four prize situation. 
Brady does grab the Zapdos there, which is going to be great and able to take a quick knockout on Barlow's side of the field. Brady just needs a lightning energy and a way to switch in order to get that Zapdos into the active position. I think a Guzma and a Lightning would be ideal here so that Brady could target down that Ditto Prism Star on Andrew's bench. Ditto evolving into Muck can shut this entire deck down by turning off Jirachi's Stellar Wish ability. Stellar Wish, very strong uh, for the Zapdos deck, allowing it to set up. We do see that Brady grabs a Viridian Forest there, which means that he has a Lightning for turn. But does he have a way to switch and get that Zapdos into the active position so that it can attack? We'll have to see. Brady attaches that lightning energy and has an escape board. So he's just going to have to knock out the active Zerua. I hope that Brady has a draw supporter for turn. And it looks like he does not. So he's just going to have to take that knockout with Zapdos, meaning that Barlow has an opportunity here to really shut down Brady's strategy if he can find an Alolan Muck. And we see him aggressively ultra balling here, discarding a rainbow energy and a devoured field. Assuming he's going for a Zorak here so that he can start using trade, but no, actually goes for a Tapu Lele, did not have a draw supporter in his hand. So fully expect to see a Cynthia come down here so that Barlow can draw some cards. He equips that double colorless onto the active. We're going to see a shuffle draw for six. Barlow is looking for a Zorark, notably for that active position, but also wants to find an Alolan Muck if he runs it. Power of Alchemy shuts down all basic Pokemon's abilities, which means that with Brady having no draw supporter for turn and a Zapdos in the active position, he would have a one turn clock to find either a backup basic Pokemon or a draw supporter to get his strategy more set up, more stabilized. We'll see what Barlow rips here off of this Cynthia. He's got the Zorark in hand. All he needs is a Pokemon communication or an Ultra Ball to find that Alolan Muck. He's going to start off with a trade, trading away the Lily. And he gets an Elm and an Elm, double Elm there. I do not believe that he has it, so he's just going to have to knock out the Zapdos. No Alolan Muck in sight, which is great news for uh, that is great news for Brady. He can continue playing the game. Brady, probably with a sigh of relief, if I had to guess, promotes Jirachi and is going. To, I do not believe. I don't know if Brady drew his card. I might have missed that, but promotes Jirachi and is going to Viridian Forest here. Trading away that fighting energy for a lightning, I'm assuming. And then may have Rescue Stretcher in hand to get him another attack. But I do like that Brady is thinning the deck first before he decides to go in with his Stellar Wish so that he has higher chances of drawing a valuable draw supporter or just something significant, something uh, to get his deck more established. See that Stellar Wish coming into play here. Looking at the top five cards, selecting a trainer card he finds there. Looks like a handful of energy, to be honest. So that's very unfortunate for Brady here. He's got one more turn to get some more basic Pokemon into play. And if he doesn't find a basic Pokemon here, he just loses the game outright. I mean, Andrew has everything he needs to take a knockout on that active Jirachi. If Brady doesn't find a way to establish his board here, this is going to be game over. He's got a Rescue Stretcher, which guarantees him an attack with Zapdos, but still no draw supporter coming down from Brady's side, which has got to be a little bit stressful. I do know that this is something that the Zapdos deck can run into from time to time. Just failing to find draw supporters off of those Stellar Wishes. You really rely on Jirachi's Stellar Wish very heavily to find those draw supporters, and sometimes the well is just a little bit dry. Brady is able to use that Rescue Stretcher. It seems like he needed the Rescue Stretcher in order to 
continue playing the game. If he didn't find that, he would have surely lost. And there it is, the Alolan Muck that I talked about. I think that this is going to be a quick game with Alolan Muck coming down. I doubt that Brady has any other way to get a draw card. He hasn't played a draw card yet, so his top deck has to be a draw card now or else he's going to get benched out of this one. And Barlow just goes for the Cynthia. He's got a heavily damaged Zorark there in the active, 110 damage on it, but it's not going to matter. Jirachi cannot do any damage. Brady might be sitting on a Buzzwole that he just hasn't benched yet for some reason, if he's planning to Sledgehammer or something like that, but I think that I have not seen any Pokemon in his hand, so he's got that one-turn window to top deck out of this. It's got to feel bad. Barlow's going to draw six cards here. And really is just looking for another Zorark so that he can trade more aggressively for the rest of the game. Does not need any sort of other evolutions. I don't think he needs to play the Lycanroc this turn, to be honest. I would just knock out the Zapdos if I was uh, Barlow here. The... Alola Muck takes care of the Jirachi. It's not going to be doing anything in this game. Barlow gets that second Zorak. It's going to trade again. And just has to announce, really, announce Riotous Beating at this point. Should just take complete command of this game. Counters Brady's Viridian Forest with Devoured Field. And it's up to Brady at the top deck here. And if that's not it, then that's going to be a quick concession. But we see Brady eyeing up the hand. Maybe he's got something that he's not showing us. That or maybe he's just slow rolling a little bit, making sure there's nothing else he can do. Brady does have an escape rope. And thank you so much, Fat Random, for the sub. Appreciate it. And yes, unfortunately, Brady just has to escape rope and hope that Barlow dead draws there. But no, Barlow has the double colorless to retreat his Tapu Lele, and that is it. So unfortunately, Brady Botner not able to find a draw supporter that game and will fall short round one as Andrew Barlow proceeds to 1-0 at the Full Grip Games League Tournament. All right, here with Andrew Barlow, 1-0 so far at the Wednesday Night League Tournament. How you doing, Andrew? Good. Uh, that was a quick one. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you feel about the Zorak, Lycanroc matchup against Zapdos generally? Zap it's really nice just because they, sh with just Zapdos, they struggle to hit the 210 in one turn. Right. And so you're able to loop Acerola and just have him muck out, stretch down to Rashi, they just sit there and couldn't do anything. Right. Yes, uh, as a Zapdos player myself, I know that it can be extremely tough to find the cards you need under that uh, Power of Alchemy ability. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, I know that uh, Brady does play the Zebstrika on his list, mm -hmm. but a lot of times it's really easy pickings for a Lycanroc to just bring yeah. up and take care of. And then he also plays the, uh, I believe, the Buzzwall, right? Yes, I think he, he also told me he, was, he threw in a Lycanroc as well. Whoa! So he had Lycanroc in that list, Buzzwall in that list. He's really trying. That, yes. Well, hopefully his supporter cards didn't come out of his list for any of this because we saw him kind of dead yeah. draw there, uh, unfortunately. So 1-0 so far. Very good. Now, uh, are there any matchups you're worried about with Zorak Lycanroc? Any matchups you're worried about seeing with your list? Uh, Blacephalon right now is the hardest one just because it, it's really hard to play around B-string turns. Yeah. I yeah. did see that you got the Devoured Field in there. Yep. Assuming you play Professor Kukui as yes. well then. Okay. So you did come a little bit prepared for that matchup. Yeah, but that's just the, going to be the toughest matchup just because killing one Blown is easy. Killing the second one right after is really hard. Right. I mean, you need things to draw just right. Yeah. You really need to be able to... Uh, you feel like in that matchup, do you usually lead with Lycanroc or you lead with Zorark? I, if in the Dream matchup, I lead with Zorark just a uh -huh. two-shot. And I can clean up with the, the second one with Lycanroc. Yeah. But usually I'm stuck having to go in with Lycanroc earlier than right. I need to. And you need to hit, like, back-to-back -back mm -hmm. Kukui Choice Band Devoured Field, which yeah. is, like, really tough to do, especially if you're getting let yeah. loose and things like that. Yeah. Hopefully it's another really thing tough. that could possibly swing that matchup is I've also thrown in the new team-up Lycanroc. Oh, very cool. To discard an energy. 
Wow. So that can kind of mess with their energy flow, especially mm -hmm. since turn one, they like to just attach an energy to their blessephalon mm -hmm. and then be ready to go turn two. So if you can kind of bop that energy, yep. uh, turn two going first yes. would be very good. Yes, it's nice. Awesome stuff, Barlow. All well, right. congrats. And then I'm sure we'll be seeing you back here for the rest of the tournament yep. uh, if you pick up a couple more wins. Yep. All right. Take it easy, man. Thanks. Thank you. Yep. Gearing up for round two at the Wednesday night league tournament here at Full Grip Games, we've got Jarrett Mesher on the right versus Zach Pra on the left. Zach Pra is going to be showing us his Blacephalon deck, and Jarrett, I believe, has a Lightning deck. So it should just be a big matchup between two powerful, hard-hitting Pokemon. Really excited to see how this one plays out for us tonight. Jarrett has got his nice... Oracle Foil GX counter there as well uh, with Zach's new GX Tag Team counter. I really love those new Tag Team counters from the new tins, the Team Up tins. They turned out fantastic. Pokemon did a stellar job with those. So big kudos to Pokemon for making some nice product in those new tins. Really digging it for sure. The Metal GX counters, if you haven't seen them yet, Definitely worth checking out. They're nice and weighty, and they've got a sweet Pokeball design on the back, too. All right, these players are going to be getting set up now, and we see that Zach does have a Poiple in his hand to start, and Jarrett, I believe, is playing a Lightning deck. I think I saw that there in his opening hand as well. We're going to see who's on the play here, who's starting off. First, I believe that either deck, uh, I feel like, gets a huge advantage from going first in this matchup. Unless, of course, the Lightning deck is able to get a turn one full blitz. I mean, then that would just be insane. But both decks feel like they're favored going first. Both decks are big, basic Pokemon that hit for gigantic one-hit knockouts. And both decks can take big one-hit knockouts you know, usually on turn two, I'd say that the Pikachu and Zekrom Tag Team GX decks probably a little bit more efficient at hitting that turn two big KO than Blacephalon is. But here we go. Enough talking about it. Let's see how this matchup goes. Looks like Zach is on the draw here, starting off with Poipful as his lead. That is fine, honestly. However, I feel like you usually want to lead Blacephalon. And it looks like he is taking notes from Zach Lesage's Collinsville Regional winning list, playing that Alolan Grimer there. So Muck could be an option for him down the road as well to turn off Jarrett's basic Pokemon's abilities. He's going to start off with a Mysterious Treasure, find another Poiple from his deck, and it looks like he's eyeing up an Ultra Ball as well looking to discard Cynthia and another Ultra Ball, presumably for a Blacephalon, judging by the fact that he's discarding the Cynthia. I'd have to guess that he has another supporter in his hand, and since he's shuffling, I'm guessing that that supporter is a Lily. So he's going to get a big draw here, turn one as well. It's pretty much an ideal turn for a Blacephalon player. He's got a Fire Energy in the discard pile, and multiple Poiple in play with a big draw here, turn one. So very aggressive start from Zach. He's got to be feeling confident about that, especially with Jarrett starting his Tapu Lele GX. A little bit of a suboptimal supporter there or starter Pokemon there for Jarrett. Zach is going to get his full eight off of that Lily. So very aggressive draw, and it looks like he does have some fire energies to attach, and even a Heat Factory Prism Star in his hand, but I like holding on to that because you don't know what kind of Pokemon Jarrett is going to be playing. It actually, looks like it's Guardy on Jarrett's side, so I am completely off base. He is playing a Gardevoir Swampert deck. This is not Picaram at all. We do know that Jarrett is a big Gardevoir fan, so he is going to be showing us Gardevoir on his side of the field. And it looks like he's got a Gardevoir and a Swampert both in his hand right now. That 
very nice Seeker Rare Ultra Ball coming down. Just deciding what it is that he should be discarding here. He opts for Timer Ball, which I think is fine. He's already got two evolutions in his hand. So the Timer Ball is going to be less good. And then, of course, the DC, nice Seeker Rare DC. Wow, Jarrett, your deck is looking pretty flames, my guy. Definitely impressed with those very swagged out looking full arts. Beautiful deck. And he's gonna grab a Tapu Lele GX here. Starting Tapu Lele, thankfully, plays a second. It's gonna be grabbing that Lele and looking for Elm's Lecture to get himself some more basic Pokemon into play. He's flashing an Alolan Muck that he has. Now, I'm not exactly sure that the a Lolan Muck is going to be a very important card in this matchup, so I'm not sure why he's flashing the camera, the A Lolan Muck. But that is good to know that Jarrett is playing A Lolan Muck in this list. And he actually could do just fine rocking the A Lolan Ninetales train. A Lolan Ninetales GX has a phenomenal GX attack which just knocks out uh, Pokemon uh, Ultra Beasts in one hit, which is incredible. Being able to just take a one-hit KO on an Ultra Beast for two energy, phenomenal, can absolutely swing a game in his favor. Uh, just right out the gate, it's got that Sublimation GX attack. Mysterious Guidance, also an incredible ability, but with Jarrett attaching the fairy energy to his active, uh, you know, and retreating. And it looks like he is going to be using Beacon here to probably go find himself some Alola Ninetales. Uh, I'd have to guess that potentially he plays counter gain in this list. Otherwise, I'm not feeling very good about the whole attached to the active Tapu Lele and retreat thing because once Zach starts to take knockouts here, Jarrett is not going to be able to accelerate two energy onto one of these little nine tails unless there is a counter gain. But it looks like he's just going to try to set up his board a little bit more, finding himself in a little nine tails and a Ralts. But I fear that not getting a Ralts into play this turn might set Jarrett too far behind in this match and leave him in a tough spot going forward. So it's going to be Zach's turn. He'll evolve into Naganadel in the active. Able to charge up to get itself out of the active. It's very good. Starting the Alolan Grimer can be a huge pain in this matchup for sure. And make it uh, actually really hard to aggress if that Alolan Grimer ever finds its way into the spotlight. You really want to keep him on the bench at all times. So... Really nice that the Naganadel can just charge up and retreat. You see Zach kind of considering whether to play any more cards from his hand. He's definitely attaching that energy to the Blacephalon, but does he play Heat Factory down? He does. And then with fewer than five cards in his hand, he'll play Erica's Hospitality for a I think he should have drawn like five cards off that Erica's Hospitality. So I think I only saw him draw two. I feel like he should have drawn like five off Erica's Hospitality. But it's fine. Okay, he's got a gigantic hand now. So maybe my camera's just skipping a few frames. He does have Let Loose in his hand and, and really way more resources than he's going to need. That's for sure. I think I like actually taking this knockout here, though, on the Vulpix. But it looks like Zach is going to just consider using Bursting Burn. I would, that would probably be my last choice as an attack to use. I think you kind of have to go in and use your attacks. You cannot give Jarrett a turn here to stabilize I don't think that Jarrett plays counter gain. 
So I think that he was just going to be stuck without a way to deal with Zach's attackers if Zach had just taken that knockout. So really tough position here for Zach, just giving Jarrett an extra turn to set up could be kind of devastating. So we'll hope that that's not going to come back to bite him. But we'll see. Yeah, I noticed that my gameplay camera is struggling a little bit right now. So we'll try to see if I can remedy that at all after the match. But for now, the show must go on. And we'll see what we can do potentially uh, potentially after the game is done here. I don't know why. It's been having some latency issues lately. Looks like Jarrett eyeing up his hand. He's going to rare candy into Swampert and get that Swampert going so that he can start to use Power Draw to turn through his deck using that Alolan Ninetales Mysterious Guidance ability to search out the item cards he needs in his deck to evolve that Swampert into play. Brooklet Hill also coming down to counter that Heat Factory Prism Star getting that out of the way and it's crazy with such a big hand advantage you think that Zach would probably be able to just run through this match but Jarrett is starting to get stabilized here I do see lots of energy and some Guzmas in Zach's hand though so he may be able to target down a threat on Jarrett's side of the field next turn probably an Alolan Ninetales GX if I had to guess and if Zach can take the first GX knockout in this matchup, he should just be in cruise control and able to overwhelm Jarrett with a board full of energy going forward. I think that shouldn't be any problem at all. Let's see, Jarrett is going to decide to bench a Ralts. Definitely need to see that in play for sure if he's going to have any hope of winning this game. And then with his Alolan Vulpix confused, he's actually just going to see if he can... It looks like he's just passing and taking more burn damage. He might actually be attempting to attack, and if he failed the attack and takes burn damage, then the Vulpix gets knocked out, which is absolutely horrible. I believe that that's what's happening here, is that the Vulpix attempted to attack. Zack is going to take a prize, and then that Vulpix also took burn damage. So what a series of unfortunate events for that Vulpix there. And the Alolan Ninetales still without energy and Jarrett with nobody good to promote. This seems like a disastrous situation for Jarrett. Uh, that Vulpix really needed to live through the turn. I think I would have been happier to see the Vulpix just pass rather than go for a an attack and fail. I think probably passing with the Vulpix is correct there, but... Uh, it's not my world. I'm just living in it. All right. Zach's turn. He's going to attach an energy to both of his Naginate L's using Charge Up. Has a gigantic hand over here. Uh, he's got Ultra Spaces. He's got Fire, Skuzmas, Let Loose. Really more options than anybody would possibly need. And if I had my guess, I would say he's probably going to target down that Alola Ninetales GX and use Mind Blown this turn to take it out of the equation entirely. He's going to attach and then probably Guzma Retreat. He's got the Retreat already squared away on his Naginadels and he's gesturing to Naginadel. He is going to retreat bringing that Alola Ninetales GX into the active position. And then he will loss zone four energy, dealing 200 damage with Mind Blown, taking a big knockout there 
on Jarrett's Alola Ninetales GX. Jarrett's going to promote the Swampert. Now, there's no way that Jarrett can possibly get uh, three stage twos into play this turn. So he is just uh, going to be power drawing here and then probably not taking a knockout. I don't think that there's really any world where Jarrett is able to get the knockout on this play. So he'll Brooklet Hill and just fail. Uh, there's no other water targets in his deck to search for. Uh, I have to imagine that he's got the rare candy into Guardi at this point. I do see him eyeing that up in his hand. So that is definitely an option that he's going to be pursuing. I think he needs to start just throwing energy onto this Guardi and hoping that there is some sort of potential Hail Mary play down the road, but I don't think that that option is even uh, even possible. There's no way Jared's deck plays any sort of let loose or anything, so Jared's just going to pass with Swampert in the active. And what's crazy about this is that Zach actually probably is not going to be able to knock out that Swampert. We do see Zach come down with the Alola Muck, though. It's going to turn off that Ditto completely, making it so the Ditto is just stuck there. Zach can, however, use uh, Burst GX and just take a, another knockout. Uh, well, I guess not knockout, but take another prize card by discarding it with Burst GX. Then move on to two prizes remaining. And if he's got a Guzma and a bunch of energy charged up in play, he'll be able to Guzma a Lele for game easy mode. Looks like Zach does see the Burst GX play there. And we'll just grab that Blacephalon out of the prizes. Chuck it to the discard pile. Jarrett on the play now with Swampert in the active. Not who he wants. A ditto on the bench that he can't evolve because of Muck, which he is reminded of. Oh, nope. Can't do that, Jarrett. Yep, bring that back to your hand. All right. He tries to evolve the ditto. Reminded that he cannot evolve the ditto. And we'll decide to power draw away the Alola Ninetales instead. Which is not, uh, not great. This is not where you want to be as a Guardi player. Unable to get your Alola Ninetales into play. And um, these guys have been able to run wild here. Wondrous Labyrinth is a great option. It's a Prism Star Stadium. Making it so that all of Zach's Pokemon will cost one more energy in order to attack. And it looks like Jarrett will Secret Spring onto the active. And the thing is, even if he attaches it, he cannot attack right now because of the Wondrous Labyrinth. So hopefully, yeah, Jarrett misses that as well. It's just going to be Zach's turn. That's really tough. So Jarrett thought maybe that he was going to be getting over with that Swampert, but now that Swampert just has three energy on it. It's not going to be going anywhere. While Blacephalon... It's really got all the time in the world to find a couple of energies and a Guzma to knock out a benched Lele. Now, it is a little bit more complicated because of the Wondrous Labyrinth. So I do know Zach has an Ultra Space in his hand. So he can just counter the Wondrous Labyrinth unless he has gotten rid of it somehow. Should be able to counter that stadium right up and and take the game-winning knockout. Looks like he's going to attach. Just charge up a couple times if there's energy in the discard pile. And he'll be good to go. But uh, he might not have everything that he needs. So he's just going to go for the Bursting Burn again. Looks like he might need just one more turn in order to, in order to make that game-winning play. Uh, he's not really opting to play a lot of cards from his hand right now. Not opting to counter the Wondrous Labyrinth either, which is interesting. Just going to opt for another Bursting Burn. Jared has been given a lot of gifts here, I feel like. Uh, there's definitely some plays where I felt like Jared could have been kind of thrown under the bus, but he is still out here swimming. And it looks like he's thinking about Guzma to get that Swampert. Uh, oh, no, he's trading away. All right, with power draw. 
It's going to power draw away the Guzma. And then looks like he's going to play Timer Ball. Looking to see if he can find any evolutions out of his deck. That looks like a double tails to me, Jarrett. But, oh, he's getting another roll. The one die flip kind of landed halfway on his uh, on his little marker there. Now it looks like Jarrett also plays the non-GX Alola Ninetales, which prevents GX Pokemon from doing abilities or doing damage to it. What's funny about that Timer Ball is that uh, Jarrett's actually just going to Ultra Ball the Pokemon from the Timer Ball away and get himself something else. So he'll go into the deck and maybe grab... I actually don't even know who he could be looking for right now. Maybe another Ralts. Maybe a Vulpix, but I don't think that there are any Vulpix left in the deck, so probably just a tough go altogether. Uh, you don't want to fail this Ultra Ball, I mean. And then you're kind of just revealing that there's absolutely nothing in the deck that can do you any good right here. It's going to grab the Ralts and... Probably put it to his bench. But at two prizes to six, I'm not sure that there's any coming back from this game. Even with a big knockout here, you just unleash Zach Praw's Beast Ring turn. And it looks like Jerry is going to bench that Ralts. And he can retreat. He does not have many stage twos in play though so that super boost energy is actually just counting as a fairy so with secret spring I believe he's used secret spring already uh, and attached the super boost which means that he is stuck doing 3, 6, 9, 12 120 damage so that's not going to be enough for knockout even with a choice band I don't think that there's any way that he rips this knockout here and even if he does take the knock at it, just feels like he probably does more for Zach than he does for himself by knocking out that Blacephalon by giving Zach the beast ring turn. So, there, so Jared's going to draw his hand to six here and kind of contemplate for a minute. He's going to end up retreating though. So he's just going to retreat into the ditto. He actually just doesn't want that ditto there in the active anymore or there on the bench anymore, so he's going to serve it up. I think that's fair. I mean, there's no point in not hitting that Blacephalon for not a knockout. But I think that Zach may have it now. Uh, we'll see. A third energy goes on to the Blacephalon, and he does have Guzma. He's going to be able to retreat and then charge back up and knock out any of the benched Tapu Lele GXs on Jarrett's side of the field. So I am going to cut real quick and see if I can fix any sort of these uh, latency issues that we're seeing on the stream. But I will be right back getting ready for round three at the Wednesday Night League Tournament here at Full Grip Games. We've got Jesse Parker on the right and Zach Pra on the left. Jesse's going to be showing us his Pikachu and Zekrom Tag Team GX deck. Promise, last round I was mistaken and it was Guardi, not Pikachu. And Zach does have our Blacephalon GX deck that we saw win last round against that Gardevoir Swampert deck. So should be a real battle of the Titans here. The big basic one-hit KO Pokemon, and I do see some Electro Chargers uh, or Electro Powers, Electro Powers in Jesse Parker's opening hand. So that is definitely the deck that he is playing. And players are getting set up now. We'll see who is on the draw shortly as this exciting game goes underway. All right. Got Jesse starting with Tapu Lele, and it looks like he is on the draw here. And it looks like he is playing Picarom as well, uh, and he has a weakness policy in his deck. So just to help protect himself against those pesky fighting Pokemon, weakness policy, a cool inclusion in the deck, an expanded format. We did see a lot of flash energy at those regional championships, which is expanded format legal. So 
seeing some weakness policies creep their way into standard format is really no surprise. Uh, it kind of is a natural evolution if you're worrying about that weakness there. We've seen weakness policy be a competitive card from time to time. When field blowers are at a, an all-time low, which they are right now. Looks like Jesse's going to be grabbing that Jirachi out of his deck here to get things started with Stellar Wish. Know that Pablo Misa was playing Jirachi in his top four Picaram list from Collinsville. So Jirachi is proving itself to be a popular inclusion in these lightning decks for sure. Jesse's going to offer the cuts and just switch the nice heart gold soul silver switch there and we'll slap the weakness policy onto his uh, Tapu Lele there for a big turn one Lily for seven. Getting himself a nice aggressive draw there off the top. Bunch of lightning energy, zap doses, nest balls very cool. Uh, I expect to see some of those cards get played. Probably the Zapdos hit the bench as well, but I think that if I know Jesse, he will go for the Pika Rom here and get a Lightning Energy onto it. Now that Jesse does like to get his Pika Roms powered up as quickly as possible. So I think I do see him throw that Pika Rom to the front of the deck. He's going to be selecting that and getting it started here. And once he's thinned his deck, Ooh, that has got to be the new Pikachu in Zekrom from the tin. I haven't actually seen that yet. At first, I was like, who is this dragon that he has chosen out of the deck? What in the world is this? This is the new Pikachu and Zekrom art. I already know that he bought the tins because he donated those sick new GX counters to us. So very cool, Jesse. Nice artwork there on your Pikachu, sir. And then he will move on to use Stellar Wish. Looking at the top five cards of his deck there, and it looks like he has the Thunder Mountain Prism Star and a Choice Band, both of which are very good. And I got Rob35 in the chat telling me that the new Picaroms are so nice and that they have texture as well. That is unbelievable. I actually will have to go out there and see it for myself. Jesse's going to Ultra Ball away two Lightning Energies. And probably go for a Tapu Coco Prism Star, if I had to guess, so that he can... Ooh, actually no, he's going to go for the Zoror, get him free retreat. Two lightnings in the discard pile, though. He is Tapu Coco Prism Star ready, so that he can use that Dance of the Ancients ability to spring some more lightning energy into play. He's got the Zapdos on his bench, too. And... All that's left is we need an attachment for turn. And it looks like he's actually gearing up to go with the Zapdos. That is a very un-Jesse Parker move if I've ever seen one. He usually loves to go for the fast peak around, but seeing a little bit more of a conservative strategy, maybe gearing up to get a turn to Thunderous Assault with that Zapdos. Zach's going to play his Heat Factory down attached to his active Placephalon and go for a Lily. It looks like he's not going to be getting a ton of draw off that Lily. Maybe just a few cards. If he was not able to thin that hand down, it looks like his hand is just jammed with Beast Rings. Just a ton of Beast Rings. He does get to see some more draw off that Heat Factory though, which is good. I really just, yeah, want to see a Poiple come down from Zack, so... We do get that in the picture, which is great. And then it looks like he might just have to use his Burst GX. We see him going for that GX counter there. He's going to Burst GX, discarding the Ultra Space. Jesse's Jirachi does wake up there. Never really matters, but you do still have to check. Jesse's now eyeing up his discard pile. Sees he's got some lightnings there. May just go for the Stellar Wish first, though, to see what all of his options are before he proceeds forward. And we do see him going for Stellar Wish. Looking at the top five cards, he's got Ultra Ball. 
but no real switch outs. I think maybe he's got an escape rope in his hand. I'm not actually sure. I think that isn't a rope in his hand. So he is going to be able to switch if he wants to. I think Cynthia is a good grab here. Get himself a draw supporter. He can uh, maybe attach somewhere after he uh, escape ropes, but I'm not actually sure that he has an energy in his hand. I don't think that he does. Zach's going to preserve his Poipal, knowing that that Zapdos is ready to attack. Promote another Blacephalon. And Jesse probably going to go in with the Cynthia here, shuffle draw six cards. So this is cool. I think that this is very safe. Going in with Zapdos, honestly attacking into this Blacephalon that does not have an energy on it means that Zack is going to have a very difficult time taking a knockout uh, this next turn. You would have to find an energy switch in order to fully power up this Blacephalon since Jesse is probably not going to be taking a one-hit KO with his Zapdos. I highly doubt it. So Jesse's just going to be content, kind of tempoing through his deck. He finds the Thunder Mountain Prism Star. It's very good. And a Lightning Energy so that he can attach onto his Picarom, start to power that up, and then go in and use that uh, full Blitz attack to really get this deck up and rolling here. Lightning Energy does come down on Picarom, and we're going to get a Thunderous Assault for 80 damage here on a clean Blacephalon while Zach has to figure out how to proceed. He is up on prizes, technically. Jesse's got a second Picaram in play now. And Jesse will do 80 damage there. I think that uh, even though Zach is ahead on prizes, I feel like Jesse's board position is a little bit stronger here. And that Jesse really is kind of ready for takeover at this point. Zach's going to play a Ditto Prism Star down to his bench. He must have just gotten that off the top deck. And evolve into Naganadel, which means that he's going to be able to charge up at least once. The problem is that none of these options really feel good for Zach. Unless he's got a Guzma in hand, he could Guzma and really take a big knockout this turn, which would be pretty substantial if he's able to find a Choice Band or maybe a Beast Energy. He could take... A knockout on a Tapu Lele, which would be absolutely huge, setting him down to just three prizes remaining, which would mean that all he has to do is knock out a Pikachu and Zekrom Tag Team GX for game. But if Zach does not have the Guzma knockout play, then he's kind of in a compromising situation. He's got to find a way to do something this turn. If he just attaches an energy to the... Active Blacephalon, I mean, it feels bad. All I can do is Bursting Burn. It's not really going to get him anywhere. The Let Loose kind of feels bad because he's got such a gigantic hand filled with B-strings, he doesn't really want to shuffle that all back in. He worked kind of hard for all those B-strings, so he's going to hang on to them, which I agree with. We see a Mysterious Treasure away, the Marshadow there saying, you know what, I ain't using this guy. It's not worth it. And I can see that. However, just leaving that Blacephalon out there to take the hit feels really bad. But Zach's not played a supporter yet. We'll see if he can pare his hand down enough to use that Ericus Hospitality. I don't think that he can. So he may just have to pass, which is what we see here. Passes with the Blacephalon active. That feels bad, guys. That is not what you want, but that escape rope, able to just stick Zach in a really compromising spot. Zach didn't even get an energy attachment for turn, I don't think. I think he just, yeah, he didn't, which is sad because he used Heat Factory, right? So he used Heat Factory, discarded an energy, but didn't get to attach one for turn. So a major feel bad. He's not even able to get ahead on energy attachments this turn. While Jesse really just in the driver's seat, getting to play another Cynthia, drops that Thunder Mountain Prism Star into play as well. So his Lightning Pokemon's attackers' attacks are going to cost one Lightning Energy less. Very strong, considering that he can go in with Pikachu and Zekrom and potentially launch a 
full blitz attack this turn. I don't think that that's necessarily what he wants, though. Ideally, you just find a switch and maybe an electro power and can take this knockout with Zapdos. But it looks like Jesse actually does not even find an energy here. So he is actually unable to attack. I don't see an energy switch either. So he too will just have to pass or just Thunderous Assault for 10. That is not where you want to be. I think if, I almost feel like if I'm Jesse, you just have to retreat into Jirachi and go for the switch here. You do not leave the, I mean, this just seems totally worthless. I think if I'm Jesse, I just retreat into that Jirachi and hope to rip a switch off of the Stellar Wish. And if not, you just pass with Jirachi active. But it looks like Jesse is actually just going to swing in and Thunderous Assault for 40 with the Choice Band. So that's what we got going on here. Zach able to get his evolutions into play. You know, his deck, his hand has something in it. Uh, not a lot of energy or draw cards, but he's got the Counter Stadium. He's got some evolutions. He's got some B strings that Jesse has not been able to. Uh, not been able to uh, unlock yet or I guess activate but that's okay honestly the more I look at this board state Jesse knows that Zach does not have Guzma in that hand or else he would have played it last turn apparently he does have energy switch so we are going to see this thing start to get powered up here and if Zach has an energy to attach for turn then we are going to see a knockout but it looks like he finally can use Eric's hospitality going to draw like six cards off that so that's pretty pretty substantial. He should find the cards he needs to take a single prize. Jesse can't really afford to let Zach go up this many prizes in this matchup though, because Jesse knows as soon as he does take this knockout, it's just going to be all downhill from there. Zach's hand is gigantic. He's got a little muck out, so there's no sort of no sort of let loose Mars Shadow play that's going to be coming into effect here either. And, yeah, I think that Jesse's really in a compromising spot now. The way these last couple turns have worked out, Jesse has not been able to take command or take lead of this game despite getting multiple gifts from Zach's side. And Zach really just poised to take control of this game here, going to four prizes remaining. Totally fine with him just attacking with this damage plus Ephelon, just taking this knockout, do what you got to do. Because once Jesse does knock this thing out, it's just B-string town, and you will get within one prize of winning the game. So as Zapdos does hit the bin, looks like Jesse does have a backup Zapdos in his hand, though. So he can respond to this Blacephalon with a Thunderous Assault for knockout. I think that's pretty much what he has to do. There's no other... No other route here that works. He needs to go for Zapdos because if he promotes a Pikachu and Zekrom, then he is just walking into a field of potential V-Strings. And losing three prizes here would be completely devastating. So Jesse needs to tread carefully. He needs to take this knockout with Zapdos. And then I would say that he... Oh, we're actually going to see Jesse go and... Thunderous Assault the Muck for not a knockout. So this is an interesting route. You're really banking on Zach not having Energy Switch Guzma in this hand, and that hand is gigantic. So I don't know how much I love this route because if, Jess, if Zach does have it, then Jesse surely loses. But that being said, it is a little bit of a high-risk, high-reward play if he is able to stick this muck, then he could potentially skip ahead a little bit and also not, uh, I guess, not kind of unleash the beast ring fury. Now, my issue with this line is that it's going to put Jesse on odd prizes, and Jesse just wants to take six prizes as quickly as possible. So 
we have to ask ourselves, you know, how can Jesse avoid that? I actually am now starting to come around on this line of play because I think what, I guess the ideal world here is that Jesse can take one prize here, then maybe somehow tag bolt two Blacephalons for knockout to skip Beast Ring entirely, right? I think that that probably is his thought process. Uh, I will say that having a muck in the active position is a Blacephalon player's worst nightmare. It actually is. I can confirm. Having that thing in the active position feels really, really bad. There are only three Guzmas in that deck, and I know that at least one has been used. So we do see Zach just passing turn after turn, which uh, Jesse's little, you know, gamble here on the muck seems to be more or less working. But I still am very nervous with Zach having such a huge hand, and uh, really he is getting very far ahead on energy attachments now because he's able to just manually attach. So the whole idea of skipping Beast Ring may just be irrelevant if Zach is able to just manually attach enough. Thank you so much, AAM06, for that sub. Appreciate you. Thank you so much. Enjoy your new gym membership and all your brand new emotes. Sweet. All right, so... Uh, Zach is actually going to have to pass all the way until this muck gets KO'd, which is unbelievable. If at any point Zach had drawn the Guzma in these last four or five turns, uh, he would have been able to just swiftly punish a Pikachu Zekrom. We see that he does have four energy in play, but it looks like that was not the case. So Zach's going to go ahead and promote a Naganadel. Maybe he has a... Guzma now and we'll just bring up one of these Pika Roms to blow it up. I think if he could knock out a Pika Rom without even using B string, it's just really, really tough. And it's looking like Jesse probably prized his Tapu Koko Prism Star. I'm imagining that that is what happened here and why we didn't see an early Tapu Koko Prism Star come down from Jesse which makes his decision to discard a bunch of energies early really tough on him because he's operating with much less energies in his deck than he would have otherwise, and he's not bringing those back into play. So really a bummer there for Jesse if he did prize his Tapu Koko Prism Star, which is what it looks like. Zach's going to take this opportunity to Ultra Ball for Lele and go forcibly drag that Guzma that he's been looking for out of the deck throw it into his hand with Tapu Lele GX's Wonder Tag, and then is going to be targeting down, I imagine, a Blacephalon, which is just really, really, or targeting down a Picaram, which is really bad news for Jesse if that's what's about to go down. You see, he's also got that Beast Energy, so just no mercy. He is dealing uh, 280 damage now with his current board state. If he Kuzma's up and, you know, and Lost Zones all of his energy. He's going to be dealing that and only needs to find one more prize for game. Should be no problem at all. It's considering his Guzma. It looks like he's just going to bring up the Lele. And I actually don't mind this play because, you know, he conserves some energy. It's fine. Takes two prizes. Says, you know what? I've got like three B strings in my hand. It's probably the case if I had to guess. He probably has like three B strings in his hand. So if he gets knocked out this following turn, he's just going to win. So Zach's put himself in a situation where he, keeping his current hand, he just wins, which is really bad news for Jesse. I don't think that there's actually any way that he finds himself out of this situation here. Uh, I guess shouldn't say anyway without a let loose. And he does have a let loose in that deck. So I didn't know if he even played a let loose. I think let loose is very strong. Jesse's going to need this turn to go perfectly. He needs to let loose Zach out of all B strings. And then he also needs to full blitz for knockout. All in one turn. So it's asking a lot considering that he does not have his Tapu Koko Prism Star at his disposal either. So 
I guess something he could do is he could attack with the Zapdos. I mean, in an ideal world, Jesse, I think, gets a one-hit KO with Zapdos while let loosing him, right? Is that going to happen? Probably not. But I say if we're dreaming, you know, if we're dreaming, that's probably what happens on Jesse's side. I think a much more realistic situation is that he takes the knockout with full blitz and then hopes that Zach does not respond. Now, granted, he was in a tough spot there deciding what to grab because he had to choose between energy switch and choice band. I think I would have gone for the energy switch there considering that uh, I guess, yeah, that's a good point. Amphi in the chat saying that he wouldn't even full blitz for KO. You just full blitz without KO. And then you go for tag bolt for four prizes altogether, which is a valid option too. Uh, I think that certainly, certainly could work out with that one beast energy on the... Uh, on the Blacephalon, I guess I'm a little bit worried about like Bursting Burn, which is a potential thing. I think they're generally correct though, that by avoiding the KO, you're probably better off because Zach doesn't have Beast Ring at his disposal and with probably a much thinner deck, he's definitely going to be finding at least one Beast Ring here. That being said, Zach, We'll have his board cleared of energy entirely if Jesse's able to get this knockout here. Uh, meaning that he'll probably have to find like two B strings in order to take the game. So Jesse actually does find energy switches and electro powers. So he's taken the knockout here. Uh, and it looks like he's kind of going all in, hoping that his let loose to four is enough to stick Zach from win. I think Zach is going to need two beast rings to pull this off and if he does not find the two beast rings he needs jesse will win the game because he is going to tag or he's going to full blitz to himself i have to imagine because then tag bolt just wins him the game he'll tag bolt for three prizes he could even tag bolt for four prizes and just win so i actually don't mind this route from jesse because Forcing Zach to find two B string is tough. Uh, I mean, it's not exactly the easiest thing to do. So, and I guess, is there a way that he can do it with one? Not with that Naganade on the active, I don't think there is. Maybe charge up twice, one, two, three, four, five. Yes, there is a way. Okay, so he could charge up twice, attach for turn, and B string once. So if he's able to get all those fires in the discard pile, which I think that there weren't, too many fires in the discard pile. I suspect that there were not because he was not charging up earlier. So I think that there's a lot of these fire energies are kind of lost in the deck, which means that he will have to just draw into B strings. So let's see if we can do it. Uh, looks like Zach is thinning his deck, either preparing for an Erica's or a Lily here. And Looks like he's going to tap and Zach's gonna Erica's for six. Can he find the two B strings he needs or a B string and, an, uh, and a way to discard some energy to charge up? He's eyeing up that hand. I imagine if there was a B string, he probably would have slammed it down, but I don't. So it looks like Jesse might just squeak out the win here with that let loose. I did not see Zach go for a B string. I think he would have just slammed those B strings down if he drew into them but we're not seeing it. Oh, apparently, yeah, he's got, what is he, Ultra Bowling charging up? Does he have a B-string? Is he slow rolling us here? Zach, if you got B-string, ah, looks like he does have it. And that's five, he has it, okay. Man, Zach did not play the B-strings first. I'm always B-string first kind of guy, but looks like he had to Ultra Ball first, get the energy into the discard pile, then B-string, charge up, Go through the motions there and take a big mind blown four game on Jesse's active peak around. So a close one for sure. Really came down to the wire. Zach eventually able to take it. Jesse prizing his Tapu Koko Prism Star. Uh, ended up making his deck just a little bit too slow. 
unfortunately not able to full blitz until the final turn of the game. A close one, but Zach will emerge victorious in round three of our league tournament. All right, guys, here with Zach Pra coming off his win here. So you're moving on to 3 0, right? Yes, sir, 3 0. Hey, excellent. Very good with uh, Blacephalon. Yes. Your favorite deck. Tried right? and true. Yes. <laughs> so your favorite deck to play. Uh, were you excited to see Zach Lesage win Collinsville with Blacephalon? Yeah, so I thought the deck was gone. Like, my thing is, like, peek around. It's gone. way faster. <laughs> Yeah. And then Blacephalon won, and I was like, maybe we should look at this again. Right. Yeah, I thought that Blacephalon just got bodied by Zapdos. That right. was, like, my big thing. Right. It was just like, it just can't keep up. And then, like, Muck. we saw Muck. Okay, so Muck is an option for the deck. But let me ask you, how does it feel having your Muck put in the active position? It's really awkward. And I thought <laughs> with, like, a 10-card hand at some point, I'd find a Guzma. But we just kept drawing random things. But I was like, we're ahead on prizes. We're doing okay. Fine, Let right? me just keep loading. Exactly. So, like, that's the thing is he did buy a lot of time by putting that muck in the active position. But it bought you a lot of time to manually attach. Right, so exactly. It didn't actually really matter uh, because he wasn't able to KO it swiftly. Actually took him forever. <laughs> <laughs> so that was interesting. I have a... Uh, have you run into any problems with starting Grimer? I have never started Grimer. Never. And I probably I've done a good I probably done like thirty games on PTCGO, oh my gosh. and I have never started Grimer. I start Grimer all the time. I don't know how. Like, it's I feel my like worst it's, feeling. I'm gonna go to a cup this weekend. I'm gonna top, <laughs> get to the finals, start Grimer both, both games, games, get two out. Uh, because there's no getting him out of there. Really, you have to. There find, really isn't. You have to find Guzman. Like there's nothing going on to get him out of there. <laughs> no. So that is, uh, that's my only problem with the Grimer in the deck is starting him feels horrible. Right. right? Uh, but otherwise, otherwise the list been running well for you? Yeah, it's been super smooth. Um, yeah. I just build mine straight up consistency. There's no, there's no reason to be cute about it. The no. deck just hits super hard. So just go for as consistent as you can get it and it, it'll take care of you. For sure, for sure. We saw you operating with like maybe 15 card hands right. there. Right, like that happens point. a lot like, more than you would think. That's kind of ridiculous, yeah. right? Especially with Heat Factory. It really just... does. Lily into Heat Factory, like you got just really like, a, you know, a 30 year deck at your right. disposal. Right. <laughs> you know, so that's pretty wild too. Is there any matchup that you're not really excited about with the Blacephalon deck? Not really, because like even last like last quarter, the only matchup I like never could beat that I hit every time I topped the cup was Grand Bowl, and that deck's kind of like unknown at this point. It's gone. There's really nothing I'm like deathly afraid of. And now you're forced to put the muck in the deck anyway, so you can right kinda exactly even, like you Zork's a little awkward. Yeah, but you still have B string. Right. So it's still pretty good. Yep. Exactly. Zorak's just like a matter of trading. Even Picaram, you just try to trade better. Exactly. Uh, it's a lot of just like try to get the first KO, try to trade better, which is really what Blacephalon does best. Exactly. So it's uh, definitely a strong deck, and I'm happy to see you doing well with your favorite uh, yeah, clowns. Yeah, I'm glad to see it's back in the format. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> it, for sure, for sure. Hey, that deck was too strong to ever be totally dead. <laughs> yeah, right. But uh, it is nice to see other players succeed with the deck that you knew you knew it was going to be right. uh, good. I, I admit I was someone who had written it off, so... Uh, well, anyways, nice to see you proving us wrong here. Yeah, man, it was good. Thank Fantastic, you Fantastic, so man. Hey, good luck in your final round. Thank you, thank right? you. And uh, take it easy, man. You as well. Getting ready for the final round here of our Wednesday Night League tournament at Full Grip Games. We've got Zach Pra on the left with that Blacephalon deck that we have seen win back-to-back -back games here on camera against Andrew Barlow, who we saw round one with his Zorark Lycanroc deck. Both of these decks were able to use Alolan Muck to shut down Stellar Wish, Jirachi in earlier rounds. We saw those strategies pay off for both players. Now it's going to be down to the wire here in the final round to see who can emerge victorious for bragging rights as well as store credit here at Full Grip Games. Andrew Barlow was talking a little bit about his Blacephalon matchup earlier, saying that it is the deck that sketches him out the most. And Zach uh, was saying that this matchup actually is not one that he's super comfortable with either. So we'll see how these players choose to navigate things moving forward. And thank you so much 
Sean, everybody, for gifting another sub. He's gifted three subs to the channel. That is Sean, who works here at Full Grip Games. A big shout out to Sean, everybody. Send Sean a big thank you in Pokemon Breeders. Welcome to the club. Thank you so much, Sean. And uh, of course, as always, if anybody orders codes, PTCGO codes, or cards for Full Grip Games, we'll get those out to you as soon as possible. Sean is ready and able to send emails with the codes uh, upon ordering. So thank you guys so much for supporting the shop, as always. And thank you, Sean, for supporting the stream. Y'all rock. All right, these players are getting set up now. And going to be uh, seeing who goes first. Going first in this matchup is a big deal. As I said, with Zorak Lycanroc getting the opportunity to get the first evolutions down is really, really big. Uh, we do see Andrew Barlow kind of eyeing up his hand here, trying to uh, visualize his opening turn. And the players are waiting for Matt's signal. Matt Price out there judging today. And it looks like Zach is going to be on the draw. Huge boon for Zach here. Going first, got the Ditto Prism Star in the active. He said he never starts a Lolan Grimer. Dude, I start a Lolan Grimer all the time. Don't know how you guys do it. Tell you what, anytime that I roll that deck online, a Lolan Grimer, he'd be out there. But Zach actually doesn't have a big playable hand. We saw him go in with a big Lily earlier in some previous games, but here he doesn't have any sort of Poiples to bench, no Blacephalons to put down, no energy to play. Just a Cynthia to shuffle and draw six cards. Not bad. But we've seen some Cynthia hands turn pretty sour. Uh, it is possible. He could draw into some B strings and some energy and really not see anything else going forward. I do see some energy switches and a Lele. Don't want to say I told you so, but I don't think there's anything in that hand. It is just a fire energy that's going to go down on that ditto, and that's going to be it, which feels horrible. So that's a big oof start from Zach here. He's going to lay lay down for maybe another Cynthia and just try again next turn. Uh, it looks like that's what we got going on here. While Barlow is sitting pretty with his Zerua there in the active position. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think Barlow plays any copies of Switch. So the whole switch into Lele and DCE knock out the Ditto Prism Star not going to be something that comes into play here. Uh, and Floatstone obviously not in standard format, so no real way to move that Zerua out of the active unless Barlow drops a DCE and goes for Kakui to turn one knock out the Ditto. But it looks like Zach's going to protect himself against any sort of way for Barlow to knock out that Ditto and retreat it into the bench, which is something that I agree with. I think that that is a great play. Meanwhile, over in Barlow land, we have a double Ultra Ball, and we're going to see an explosive start here from Andrew Barlow. You know that already, playing his entire hand down. I fully expect him to get a Lily hand here and just draw a ton of cards. And what's funny is we see the Professor Alms Lecture getting discarded as well. Uh, I think he's signaling that he wants a very aggressive draw here to start, especially from Zach's suboptimal turn one. I'm um, thinking that Barlow just wants to go for it, and that is probably a Lily uh, as the last card in his hand. He's just going to double Ultra Ball, get Ditto, and the Zerua. I like this play a lot. And then a huge turn one Lily for eight cards, right? Going to be a phenomenal go here. Though we do see Andrew Barlow have to discard a Devoured Field, which feels really bad considering that is the card that he uses to knock out Blacephalons in one hit. So uh, one Devoured Field down. That being said, uh, with such an aggressive start here, you have to think that there's probably not a ton of ways for uh, Barlow to fall behind here. Uh, it's going to be at least another turn or two before Zach is going to be up and attacking. Zach's turn now, though. We do see an evolution into Naganadel on the bench and a charge up coming 
down into play as well. Zach is probably not going to be attacking here, which is going to be very tough. I think that he just is looking for a Blacephalon to start putting energy onto, if I had to guess. But if Barlow is able to get a turn two knockout on that Lele, that would just be absolutely disastrous. And the thing is, is that Barlow knows that Zach has a uh, an Erica's in his hand. He only has three bench Pokemon. But Zach finds a Cynthia. He's just going to opt to shuffle draw six, attaching to the Lele. I mean, that Lele is eventually going to have to get attached to in order to retreat. There are no switch cards in the Blacephalon deck, so that's probably fine. Though, I don't really want to see Zach retreat into anybody this turn. I think retreating feels bad. I think you kind of just hope that Barlow doesn't have Choice Band Kakui here. I really don't want to see Barlow, or I don't want to see Zach retreat this Lele. No fear. Just say you don't have it, my guy. And he does. All right. So he's going to pass to the Lele active. I like this play. If Barlow has it, he has it. If not, then Zach can still kind of make some room for himself in this matchup, I guess. But it's going to be tough. There's no way that he can go up and knock out this uh, Zorark this next turn. I think that it's just uh, that's just not happening. So Barlow said his ideal strategy there is going to be to try and two-hit KO the first GX. And that's what we're seeing here. So he's going to get a two-hit KO on this first GX, which feels really good for him. And Zach doesn't even have too many energy in play. So having to manually retreat two different Pokemon in the first two turns of the game means that he is two energy attachments behind and is board is showing that. You don't really want to have to go up into Azuric and Bursting Burn or Burst GX, but we might be seeing a Bursting Burn come from Zach's side of the field. I think that that's probably the play that I want to see if I'm if I'm Zach, because you just soften up the Zorak a little bit. You're not really interested in taking odd prizes. Burst GX doesn't really do anything for your board state against a Zorark deck because you're going to be taking three GX knockouts whether or not you like it. So I think that Zach is definitely going to be looking to just deal that 20 damage, confuse the Zorark, and hope that there's no way that Barlow can, can knock out the Blacephalon. Now I do like Barlow going for a Poipal here, assuming he's going for either Poipal or the Naganadel. I don't think he's going to get knockout on that Naganadel. He's going to grip the... Uh, ooh! Actually, he is bringing up the Naganadel. Which means that he needs another bench Pokemon and a Devoured Field, which I did see in his hand. So he's going to take out that Naganadel aggressively, which is fine. If he's able to do this twice then he can put himself down onto even prizes, which is very good. And also just keep Zach from being able to get energy into play aggressively, which is super, super strong. I still think that Zach's uh, plan of attack remains the same. He is going to be looking to bursting burn the Zork and hope that Barlow does not have an Ace Rolla to get himself out of it. Now, Barlow did just preemptively go for the Mallow, so... We at least know that that is not an Acerola, which is good. And also, being Zach, you know that he can't Acerola and knock out a Blacephalon in the same turn. So that's a little bit of a safety net as well. Going forward, if you Bursting Burn, you really put the Zorak deck in the most compromising situation that you can. Zach does promote the Blacephalon. He kind of has to know the route. This is your only chance at survival here is to oh wow he has to pass zach has nothing in that hand oh my gosh how horrible is this and barlow is just going to sprint ahead here um i mean i don't know that he has the knockout but being able to deal 150 damage with a potential choice ban to this Blacephalon is disastrous and getting that fighting energy down zach missing an energy altogether Gosh, this is terrible. I don't think that 
Zach's going to have any way out of this. Barlow's about to stack his hand with anything that he needs to take command of this game. And we're just seeing the consistency of Zorak really take control here. As Zach's luck with the Blacephalon deck really runs dry. Because I mean, we saw him in those other games really just flaunting those 13, 14, 15 card hands. Not here. It does not even have a fire energy to spare. This deck is literally one-fourth fire energy, but cannot find a fire energy to attach that active Blacephalon to use any of its attacks this following this past turn. Barlow is going to trade into the two cards that he stacked with Mallow, and now Barlow is the one with the gigantic hand and all of his resources available to him. There is no way in my book that Barlow is able to lose this game at this point. He is so far ahead, though he's only one prize ahead, his board position is so astoundingly better that I don't think there's any way to fall behind. Barlow is content to just hit into this Blacephalon for 120 damage. He knows that 130 with Devour. He knows that Zach, yeah, did not have a draw support last turn, but it looks like he did top deck a Cynthia. So the game's not actually completely over, though it kind of is, because in this point, like, Barlow can ace a and still knock out the Blacephalon, which is, you know, completely going to ruin Zach's plan of having to bursting burn this turn. Previously, uh, Barlow would not have been able to ace a and knock out the Blacephalon, but... That strategy really just gets undone here. And also with the Lycanroc GX available on the bench, just ready to Dangerous Rogue 2, uh, Zach is just in a highly compromising situation. He does find the Beast Energy there and a Lily for next turn, so that's very good. Another Beast Ring and an Energy Switch. So very odd draws there from Zach. He's got three Beast Rings, but no Poiples. So having a really hard time finding those. And I guess with the way that his hand has worked out, he actually can get four energy into play, and Zach can actually take a knockout on this. If he can charge up this turn, he will have four energy in play with a beast energy and can just mind blown for 230. So I might just be eating my words here soon. If Zach gets the first GX knockout, he's going to win this game. All he has to do is charge up once. If he has it, then he might not have a fire in the discard pile, though. I don't think he does. Oh, my gosh. And we see him just go for that bursting burn. That is so sad. Did not have a fire energy in the discard pile. He could not charge up again and just has to go for that bursting burn for 20. And things are looking grim again here for Zach, so close with the energy switch and the beast energy, but not able to put all the pieces together to take that knockout on the 210 hit point Zork. We're just gonna put the ball back in Barlow's court here. He's gonna trade, looking for probably an Ace Arola, and he's got six cards to find it. And I believe that that was the Ace Arola there. No, that's Cynthia. All the full arts kind of looking the same. The full art Cynthia, also purple, just like Ace Arola. So he's got Guzma. He's going to bring up the other Blacephalon here, and it looks like he's promoting Zorark. So does that mean he's just going to be softening up this thing, or what is he doing? Oh, he's got multi-switch. Okay, well, that's kind of cool. But he doesn't decide to Dangerous Rogue it. So I'm curious, why is Barlow not using Dangerous Rogue here to knock out this Blacephalon and instead just hitting it? I actually don't know that Barlow just kind of walked his way into a potential way to lose this game. Um, I think if Zach can find an energy switch, then he could, he could take a knockout. Uh, that's it. Oh, I guess that, yeah, I guess Barlow probably didn't have the choice band in his hand either. 
for the Dangerous Rogue Knockout, Zach has actually not played a whole lot of Pokemon down on the bench. Not enough for Barlow to take a knockout with Dangerous Rogue anyway. So Andrew just has to kind of go ahead and soften these guys up. And Zach taking a big old look at that hand like, I ain't got nothing, Chief. There's not a lot going on in that hand. Crazy. Crazy stuff there. So Barlow does have a... He actually had the choice ban all along. So he just opted not to take it. Uh, not to take that knockout with Dangerous Rogue. And just go away for the soften up anyways. I have to imagine that Barlow is able to find an Ace Arola here though. And bounce this uh, Zorark around. Uh, the deck is getting very small here. I still don't see the Ace Roll in his hand, so it could just be like the last card in his deck, which would be uh, pretty insane at this point. I think he does have one more trade available to him. He's just going to pal pad some things back into the deck before he goes for his final trade. Seeing the Guzma go back in and the Ace Roll. Wow, the Ace Roll was actually in the bin. So I'm not sure that he plays two. I think he probably only plays one. So now he has a decent shot at drawing that Ace Rola off of his final trade. Or Guzma, really. Either of them get him guaranteed knockouts on a Pokemon GX this turn. But it's crazy to me how slow this game is going. I mean, really, both players uh, not hitting big knockouts early on. That's exactly what Blacephalon is supposed to do. And sure enough, we see, I think, maybe a Field Blower and a Muck. But Barlow coming down with the switch. I said it. Uh, turn one, he does not play switch. And here I am eating my own words. Yes, he does. There is a switch in that deck. I didn't see that coming. But sure enough, a big old Seeker Rare switch. So Barlow is going to go down to three prizes and unleash Zach's Beast Rings. Zach has got to put the pedal to the metal and make this happen now without benching too many Pokemon or else uh, Barlow is going to be able to trade here uh, successfully. Now, I think that it's possible that Barlow was just trying to save his choice band so that he could take out clean Blacephalons later in the game. Definitely a possibility. At this point, only needing to take three prizes, though, with a Rock Ruff there on the bench is just so good for Barlow because that means that even if he just has to knock out this damaged Blacephalon, then he can just use Dangerous Rope or use a... Bloodthirsty Eyes to bring up that Naginate L and finish it off for game if need be. There are just so many different ways for Barlow to win this game at this point. Zach is going to dive in and just start using B-String. Now what's cool here is that he actually does have the Beast Energy and his opponent is at three prizes. So uh, Zach actually can use Turning Point for 190 right now, which is kind of cool. 190 uh, does actually get a knockout on a bench Tapu Lele. So if that was like, uh, if that was a play that he could pull off, it would have been sweet. But we actually did not see Zach play down the Beast Energy at all. So it looks like he's saving that for later. Potentially for a clean uh, Blacephalon. Getting the Let Loose also very strong because he's just going to disrupt Barlow's hand. Barlow had access to his entire deck at this point. So giving a let loose and saying, hey, you know what? You actually are only going to get shuffle draw four and then maybe two trades. That's better. Eight cards better than, you know, whatever else you had, like 12, 15 before. So Zach's going to see what he gets off of his four cards here. He's got charge up that he knows he's putting on to the Naginate Elf. So he's going to go ahead and equip that. Ultra Space to counter Devoured Field, which is good. So we know that's probably the second Devoured Field I'd see. And then he's going in with the Ultra Space to get another Blacephalon. It looks like he's grabbing two energy too because he's got a B-string in his hand that I expect him to reveal right there. So fully loaded board, only one Naginadel. But, I mean, he is taking a knockout here. Uh, albeit with an extremely... Uh, sad looking Blacephalon with you know, way too much uh, damage on it. 
I think he's got no other route. Benching that other Poipo feels really bad too. You're just there's no way that a uh, Lycan Rock is gonna whiff knockout on you later. So just feels bad, but I understand that he kind of feels pressed for energy at this point. You know, Barlow's already got knockout on board on this thing. Totally fine. All Barlow needs to do is continue drawing cards. He's got DC choice band. It's literally all he needs for game uh, to clean things up with his final Lycan Rock for the final Dangerous Rogue. So Barlow's got this one in the bag, really. Nothing he can do to mess this one up. Uh, no sort of acerola needed. Really just would try and thin his hand as much as he can. Probably play cards like Timer Balls and things like that. I don't think that Zach is going to let loose him again, but it could happen. I don't think that there's any four-card combination that like loses Barlow the game, or I shouldn't even say four. It's like a be like a seven card combination that loses in the game i don't think that that's possible but we'll certainly see zach gonna promote his clean blacephalon with barlow just at one prize remaining and he's gonna look through his discard pile get those charge ups onto the nag and L's. but unfortunately i think it's just too little too late for zach and his clowns I think that, yeah, he's got to take a knockout. He has to go for the mind blown. But even a let loose doesn't really do it. That dangerous rogue is just looking too scary, especially with the fourth benched Pokemon too, that Poipal. I don't think the Poipal should have necessarily hit the bench, but we also already know that Barlow did draw into his choice ban already. So even if Zach had limited his bench to just three, it wasn't going to matter because Dangerous Rogue was going to take that knockout either way. And we see Zach just actually going straight for the Mind Blown here. And Barlow swiftly promoting that like a Rock GX. All he needs to do is equip DCE or the Fighting Energy and go for that Dangerous Rogue for game. So that's it. Good game to both players. Zorg Lycanroc emerging victorious in this Wednesday Night League Tournament. Going 4-0 oh, at the hands of Andrew Barlow. So congrats to Andrew for a job well done. And the win. Good games played by Zach, too, with his Blacephalon deck. A mirror of the Collinsville Regional Championships Finals, except this time Zork coming out on top. So very good and well played by all. And we'll get Zach back here, or not Zach, we'll get Andrew back here for one more interview to talk about his win. Uh, <laughs> Barlow, you got me live in your pocket. Man, we're getting some weird feedback loops here. Andrew Barlow, everybody. 4 yes. 0, Wednesday night, Full Grip Games Tournament. How you doing, Andrew? Good. Good, man. So that match went how you wanted it to, didn't yes. it? Yes. Yes. So, uh, and obviously, yeah. Zach drew pretty suboptimally. Yes. But, yeah. but Zorik I, looking consistent as ever. Yeah. I, I had a little awkward stage where I had the 130 on the first Blacephalon yeah. but because of his awkward start if I let him have beast rings yeah. I didn't have the return knockout right on a second Blacephalon that would have right okay no I understand yeah it was actually like kind of intense because that one hand that he drew into off of the um off of the Cynthia, mm -hmm. uh, it's like he all, he drew into like three B strings, which is yes. like super weird. But then he like also had energy switch and beast energy. So like he could, if he just had one more energy in the discard pile, yeah. he actually would have gotten the first GX knockout because wow. he could have slammed the beat, but he didn't have anything down. <laughs> he just couldn't do it. He just had yeah. to bursting burn again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now the switch in your list, what inspired you to play switch? Switch is just sometimes or for when those you because Zorak you don't play a lot of energy. Yeah. So you don't always hit your energy attachment every turn. It's just you get in those awkward situations where you just you need to switch but you don't want to Guzma or you can't Guzma cuz you with Lycan Rock you usually only play one or two. Right. So just having that extra option to get out of a situation kind of like with the bursting burn. I thought it was really strong. 
Uh, I was actually talking about his ditto start at the beginning of the game, mm-hmm. and I was like, yeah, unfortunately, I don't think that Barlow has any way to potentially donk that ditto right. with Lele. I was like, there's no way he plays Switch. Mm-hmm. Sure enough, you play Switch. Yeah. <laughs> so then I was like eating my own words. Yeah. Uh, but very cool, actually. Uh, we saw both the Switch and the multi-Switch put in work there mm-hmm. against that deck, which was very nice to see. So mm-hmm. cool stuff. Is there anything else that you consider maybe interesting about your list that you'd like to share? I think Switch was something that I saw was pretty unique. And yeah. Outside of the, there is no Zor- Lucario at all in the deck just because yeah. you just cut it. I also like having the one of Lily is even with like running Elms is really nice because I showed it off that game where oh yeah like I even had the Elms but it's just having double Ultra Ball and just Lily for eight was just so much better of a hand. It was, it was. I mean, because then that's the most explosive draw card in the game yeah. really is the yeah. turn one Lily for eight. So being able to go for that was very good. You showed us on one of your other games in stream. You went for the Elm early, mm-hmm. set up you know stable that way. But then the Lily turn, I mean, then you just are off to the races. You got two, three mm-hmm. Zorks out very quickly. Yes. So awesome stuff, man. So 4-0 at tonight's tournament. Mm-hmm. Uh, what games did you play against in the matches you weren't on camera? Uh, off stream, I played against Moses, Nick Moses's Ultra Malamar list. Yep. That was a close back and forth game. Very cool. And he actually wound up killing a ditto with Beast Energy and Metal Energy on his on his uh, what? On his Ultra Necrozma. Oh my gosh, oh, that's super funny. So yeah. then, uh, um, so you played against Ultra Necrozma, and then what was your other? If you I played against Char- a Charizard deck. Oh, very cool. Very yeah, I cool. think he was watching your stream. Yes, yes. sounds good. <laughs> yes, he right. actually got the turn two Charizard, but whoa, his yeah. downside was that was his only Charizard he got uh, up. Oh well, <laughs> so <laughs> you do what you can. Yeah, so he had the turn two knockout and on a Zorark, but then he just kind of just stopped after that. Yeah, especially if you can get Muck into play, something down the draw yeah. is like very, very good. Yeah. So you have any idea what you're going to spend your store credit on tonight? Uh, not tonight, no. Probably right. just save it up, save it up for next week. Sounds good, man. Well, congrats, mm-hmm. Andrew. Thanks for the interview, man. Thank and you. good luck in your future endeavors. All right, so that is it. Andrew Barlow, the winner of the Wednesday Night Full Grip Games League Tournament. Thank you guys all so much for hanging out and watching. I appreciate it. Big shout out to Josh Carnell for those bits. Thank you so much. Big shout out to Jesse as well. Donated some bits tonight. To all the subs, thank you guys all so much. All the wonderful subs tonight. You guys rock. Thanks to everybody who followed the channel. I saw those follows ticking in here throughout the course of the night. Don't think I ain't watching that. I am watching that. So thank you guys so much for all the follows as well. You guys rock. Appreciate it. Big shout out to everybody who supports the shop as well. Sean for gifting subs. You rock, my dude. So thank you everybody for supporting the shop. Full Grip Games also really, really appreciate all of the love and support. We're going to spread some love tonight over to Riley's channel going to be raiding Munner, guys. So we got my good friends Riley and JW are going to be doing their tag team where they discuss Pokemon and things like that, the metagame, all that. You can hang out on their stream. They are awesome dudes. So we're going to raid them and show them a good time tonight. So make sure to give Riley's channel a follow as well as Flex Daddy Righteous. Uh, while you guys are over there, also big shout out to Natalie for being our table judge and runner tonight. Natalie deserves all the love in the world because she's amazing. That's right, Natalie, you're amazing. Thank you. You're amazing, all right. So, and that's gonna be it. With that, I'm signing off, rating Riley, so you guys all hang on tight while we go over to Munnerland. All right, y'all take it easy. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful stream. Peace.